Thank you, Brother Clint. Revelation chapter 7. Some of you are probably saying now, Pastor, what are you doing in the book of Revelation? Don't you know this is Palm Sunday, right? Now, we see that they have palms here. And what I want to talk about this morning is what are you doing with your palms? I want to talk about this morning, what are you doing uh, as you glorify God in your life and what, what are you known for? This Palm Sunday is a week before the resurrection of Christ. So it's a week before the death of Christ, if you will, right? This is that final countdown, that final week. And I just want to ask some questions. I want to provoke some thought and I want to let the Holy Spirit do the rest. But if I told you that I was going to die this week, that that was it for me, I'm done. But I have some very important things that I feel that I need to share with you. wonder what kind of things would be most important. It certainly wouldn't be the things of, you know, how to feed the dog and how to maintain the air conditioner. I, you know, tell, tell my people at work that, I, you know, I enjoyed working with them. If you were to die and you knew you were about to die and you knew that your time was short, you would probably have a punch list of things that you would want to share with those that you love the most. My father passed in December of last year, and I was able to spend a little bit of time with him prior to it happening, and he knew it was happening, and there were some things, some final business, if you will, that we were able to discuss. One of the greatest things was, don't cry for me, I know where I'm going, and that's good news. We're talking this morning about Palm Sunday, which came about a week before the resurrection, and Jesus had some things to say to his disciples. He was really driving some things home, and I'm starting here at the end of the story. It's called Our Resurrection. There is coming a day when we will be resurrected unto eternal life with the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will be like Him. We will receive a new body. Just as Christ was transfigured, we will be transformed. We will be translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. This resurrection, there are many names and titles for it throughout the Bible. It is called the regeneration is one of the names for it, or the renewal of all things, or this is where the word revival truly comes from. It's talking about putting life back into something that was dead, and one day we're going to stand on our feet after we've passed, and we're going to be with the Lord, and that's going to be a very victorious and triumphal day. Now, Christ, as he knew he was about to die, gave some instruction, but his thoughts were, one day you're going to be with me in the resurrection. Let's look at that day. Revelation chapter 7, if you would look at verse number 9, the Bible reads, And after this I beheld and load a great multitude which no man could number. All right, so millions and millions and billions of people, great multitude, you can't count them, there's so many, of all nations and kindreds, and people, and tongues. So these are a group of people, not that just exist today, but a people from all times, from all lineages, from all tribes. So these are all of those in that resurrection from all time. It says they stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes. Now that's representing our new righteousness given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ because he forgave our sin. It says, they stood before the throne and before the lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. Now I really wanted to jump the fence over there and cut a couple palm branches and bring them in as an illustration. Uh, but I'll just work with the palms that I have. So if you'll just visualize some big green things flowing as I do that, perhaps it will help you. Why is it that God is showing us that in the resurrection, when we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and we stand with Him as He's about to pour out His wrath, it says that we have palms in our hands. This is a sign of peace and tranquility, but it's also a sign of victory. That we have gotten the victory over the grave, and thank God we've gotten the victory over hell by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. In that resurrection, he says, we have white robes and palms in our hands. Look at verse number 10 with me. And cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. True victory comes at that moment of salvation. Listen, we get two victory days. 
the day that we're saved and then the day that we're resurrected. That's both called the day of our salvation. If you would go to John chapter 12, I want to share some of the things that Jesus said as he knew that this was his last week on the earth. He knew this was his last feast, his last Passover, the last meal was coming, his last words. And so those that were closest to him, those that he spent the most time on earth ministering to, he had some special instructions. He had some very important things that he really wanted them to just kind of lock in and remember for the rest of their life on earth. In John chapter 12, when you get there, join me in verse number 10. The Word of God reads, But the chief priests consulted that they might put Lazarus also to death. Right? This is, <laughs> they're trying to kill Lazarus again. Okay, uh, But that by reason of him, many of the Jews went away and believed on Jesus. They said, this guy has such a testimony, he was he died and he came back to life. And now everybody wants to hear him preach that there's everlasting life through Jesus. So uh, the, the, the Pharisees were upset. The chief priests were upset. Look at verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna! Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. This shout of Hosanna in a sense is saying, God save us. This shout is a victorious statement where they're crying out to their Savior, you alone can save us. If you notice in our uh, bulletin, we always do uh, King James word uh, definitions. And it says here, it is an exclamation of praise to God or an invocation of blessing. Things. Literal meaning, save, we beseech you. So what they're doing, and when they see Jesus coming in, they're saying, save us, we beg you. Please, you can save us. Hosanna, give us victory. So they're calling to Jesus for this victory. Look at it in verse 13. They took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, Blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the king of Israel that has been prophesied for for many years to come. He is the savior and he comes in the name of the Lord. I have to point out though that many that, that looked for Christ expected him to set up an earthly kingdom. We're ready right now uh, we have a tyrannical government that's very oppressive, right? We have a crooked religious system and uh, a dishonest taxation system. And they, they, the Romans, they've changed our money. It was replaced and then debased and we're all broke and we're slaves and we're servants in our own country. And so they, all, they had many reasons that they wanted a higher level of freedom, much like we do today. I mean, we are free, certainly, to do certain things. And, hey, they're free in India and Russia and even China to do certain things even to this day. But won't it be a great day when we can stand with the Lord and He will be our King and no one can oppress us? Won't that be a great day? Don't we look forward to that? Look what he says in verse 14. And Jesus, when He had found a young ass, sat thereon as it is written. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus, you're the king. All right, what's the first thing you're going to do as the king? All right, all right hold on. If I, Pax, if I elected you president, you're the president of the United States, and you say, well, my first action is office. Well, first I want to get a big Cadillac bulletproof limo. That's what I'm going to ride around in, okay? And then maybe a couple Lamborghinis to play with, right? Jesus took a lowly donkey as his means of transportation. I mean, that's kind of like saying, I'll take that old work truck. Just a beat up old work truck that nobody's expecting anything special. So first of all, I want you to understand that the God of all creation decides to represent himself in a very lowly, humble, and meek way. Now we're called to go and do likewise. We're called to go and do the same things he did. We're called to serve others by love, serve one another. Didn't it say of Jesus Christ that he came in the form of a servant? He came in the form of a servant. Yeah, but he's the king of Israel. 
Surely he can have anything he wants. Why doesn't he come in with a fancy chariot and the best racehorses and uh, guards and gold? He came in meek and lowly, humble, setting the standard for us so that we understand that in God's economy, in God's world, things are upside down. And if you really want to help somebody, it's not about how big and powerful you are. It's about humble and meek you can be. Jesus is setting the standard as the king of Israel. Listen, if any organization has a problem, when a business has a problem, it usually stinks from the head down, doesn't it? Right? When you go to, it's like there's certain stores, you go in there like, boy, the manager has problems and you know what? I'm just not interested in going back there because they're allowing this bad environment. We'll go to the one on the other side of town if we have to, or we'll just go to their competition. I don't care. Well, Jesus is trying to show us how to serve others. Look at verse 15. He says, fear not, Daughter of Zion, behold, thy king cometh sitting on an ass's colt. These things understood not his disciples at the first, but when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that he had done these things unto him. The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and raised him from the, dare, the dead bear record. Now, here I want to point this out. The people that were with him that saw Jesus and experienced the miracles, they're doing what is our reasonable service, our duty to do, and that is to bear record. If I were to ask you by a show of hands, is there anybody in here that could raise your hand and say, God has been good to me? Who can raise your hand? God has blessed me. God has given me more than I deserve. God has helped me. Yay, I have a miracle I want to tell you about. Are you bearing record as this crowd did? That was, their, that was their job. That was their duty. Brother Chad, would you check, check the air in the back? I don't know. Is anybody else hot in here? Is it just a little bit? We could use a little air. Miss Sandy says, yes, let's do it. All right, thank you, sir. We had the doors open earlier. What a beautiful day. But summer's coming. It's going to be a hot one. So, all right. So I want to point out in verse number 17, one of the things that Jesus is demonstrating here is that those that were touched by Jesus were bearing record, it says at the end of verse 17. Now look at verse number 18. It says, For this cause the people also met him, for that they heard that he had done this miracle. The Pharisees, therefore, said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. They were really upset. They're, Don't you see what's happening? The whole world is going after Jesus. You know, we live in a time today where people say, you can't do it the way they used to do it. We're not like in the book of Acts where you could just go into a new city and preach to pagan people that had never heard Christ and their hearts would be turned and their lives would be changed and they would be delivered from the sins and the diseases. It's not like that today, don't you know? Hey, in America, don't we live in a time... I mean, we're in the South. We're, we're kind of like the burnt-out district. We've seen religion come and go and come and go and most people are just totally apathetic. They'll say, yeah, I go to church, I watch online. Oh, really, when was the last time you did that? Um, I don't know, it's been, you know, a couple weeks ago, maybe, I forget. What's the name of your church? Oh, um, hey, honey, what's the name of that church? I mean, it's like, wow, I mean, as Christians in the South, we sure are unchurched and kind of far from Christ. And I just want to point this out. We live in a time where we feel like the world cannot be reached for Christ. But that's not true. It's not true. Hey, I, I know a young man that is a, a, a missionary from a church in Mexico to preach the gospel in the United States. That's sad. You understand what's happened? The tide has turned. America was known for sending the gospel out everywhere to the corners of the earth where people had not heard the name of Jesus. We're going to go out there. Now America's got so backwards and pagan and upside down that other countries... Countries that are way more poor than we are are saving their nickels, their pesos to pay somebody to preach the gospel over here so America can be touched by Jesus. I want you to think about what this says here at the end of verse 19. Behold, the world is gone after him. Fellow believers, is not this our goal? Isn't this our purpose? 
Now that you're saved, don't you have a purpose? And that's to help the world go after him. The problem is the world can't follow you and you're not going after him yourself. We have to do as Christ and lead by example. I want to talk about these palms because you see where they came in and they're waving their palms. Imagine those are palm trees, okay? All right. And they're waving their palms. Hosanna! Save us! Jesus, the King! And the Pharisees, oh, great. Now everybody's going to get saved. What are we going to do? If you would go to Leviticus 23, go to the Old Testament to Leviticus 23. This is relevant. Uh, this is symbolic. Again, let me tell you, it's of victory. It's of salvation. It's of rejoicing. Uh, if you have something good to say, you usually say it, right? I mean, hey, frankly, people go down to these stadiums all the time, don't they? Don't you go down to the stadium, they put on a big foam for what finger? Like, hey, number one, Jags are number one. And then they come to church and they sit like a bump on a long and they won't even say amen when they agree with something the preacher's saying, right? Now listen, guys, I just want to tell you, it's our job, it's our duty to proclaim the works of Jesus Christ, to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, and our goal is that the whole world would go after him and we have that power through the Holy Scriptures and the Holy Spirit. We can do this. This is obtainable. I don't care how wicked America is, go is going or has gotten. It still works. I don't care. L, B, G, T, Q, A, I, D, S. Whatever letters they want to put in this. Oh, don't you know? They're different. I don't care. Preach the gospel. That's our job. We can change culture with the gospel. That's our goal. I don't believe in atheists. That's what I tell them. Well, I'm an atheist. Oh, well, God doesn't believe in atheists. God doesn't believe in atheists. You're in Leviticus 23. I want you to see this. Look at verse number 40. This was symbolic. Leviticus 23 gives us all these feast days and feast weeks and the free will offerings and sacrifices. Verse 40. And ye shall take you on the first day the boughs of goodly trees, branches of palm trees, there it is, and the boughs of thick trees and willows of the brook, and ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. It says Rejoice before the Lord your God. The palm trees are representing you rejoicing before the Lord. Go to Psalm 118. Notice it says rejoice seven days. Do you understand this was a feast that he commanded his people? I want you to do this every year for seven days. You start off solemn and serious. That first day is like a Sabbath. There's no work because, hey, there's no work in your salvation. Jesus Christ did all the hard work. All you have to do is trust in him. And that last day is also a Sabbath, right? So this is symbolic. And they're rejoicing because of their salvation, there is no work for salvation. And I just want to ask you, if you're saved, are you waving your palms to Christ? Are you holding them up and rejoicing? Thank God I'm saved. Hey, thank God I've been blessed. Thank God for my health and my family and my friends. And boy, I have the Word of God, the completed Word of God. Most of the people we read about, they did not have their own personal copy of the entire Scriptures, the whole counsel of God. Amen. That's right, young lady. Look, she's waving her. She says, I have a reason to rejoice. Amen. Are you excited for what God's doing for you? Do you understand that uh, it, what, what it, it says, we bring the sacrifice of praise? Do you understand we sacrifice by praising God? Do you understand that when we rejoice God with the fruit of our lips, this is an offering that we give to God? And I just want to ask you, what are you offering to God? If God said, hey, New Testament church, just like they did in the Old Testament, I want you to take the next seven days starting today, and I want you to give something to me. I want you to rejoice me. I want you to sing unto me. I want you to dedicate some time and uh, quit staring at your screen and put that down and turn the TV off and open up the Word of God and just get in there and dig in and fall in love with the Word of God. I want you to open your mouth and boldly preach the gospel to strangers. What if God knocked on your door? And he says, I want you to invite one person a, week, a day to church for the next seven days. 
Or even harder than that, what if he said, I want you to find somebody to preach the gospel to for the next seven days, and this will be your sacrifice of praise. They were waving their palms and rejoicing. Hosanna! Blessed is the name of the Lord. Right? Blessed is Jesus Christ, the King of Israel. When's the last time that you really got excited for something of God? When's the last time that you got on fire for God? The whole world has gone after him. That's what the Jews said. And Christianity used to be that way. But we've got a lot of distractions these days, don't we? We've got our own agenda. We've got our own priority. Don't you know how hard it is? I know how hard it is. I work a full-time job. And I'm not saying that to, you know what? Hey, I want to work full-time for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what I want to do. You know what I would call success in our church? Is the day that we can have full-time soul winners on staff at the church. Wouldn't that honor the Lord Jesus Christ? Or we can take some of these young men and say, hey, uh, I know you're working a trade, but let me hire you to send you to knock on doors and preach the gospel every single day. There's somebody that wants to get saved every day of the week. Salvation doesn't stop just because it's Monday morning. In Psalm 118, if you will with me, look at verse number 22. This is the prophecy of Jesus. This is where we get the phrase Hosanna. It's pointing back to this. Verse 22, the stone which the builders refused is become the head of the corner. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the foundation of your salvation. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Verse 24, this is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Who has something to be glad in? Who has something to rejoice? Hey, you know, I mean, I want you to think about it. Like praising God, waving your hands, or if you had palm trees. Boy, I, I wish I had some palm trees. I'm telling you, I would, I'd run up and down the aisles right now just getting excited like a cheerleader. Man, I love God that much. He's been so good to me. And I wish I could just share some of this zeal with you and get you excited and understand what these people were going through as they received the Lord Jesus Christ as their king. They were worshiping him for his salvation. Verse 25, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. That's where they get Hosanna. Save us, I beseech thee. Oh God, I'm begging you, save us, help us, deliver us. We love you, we're trusting in you, only you can save. Verse 26, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. Go to Matthew chapter 21. I want to look at this parallel of the same account. Brother Chad has been preaching through uh, Mark in Sunday school this month, and he's working his way up, and, and he actually landed on this chapter today. And I was worried because it's like, I'm going to preach about Palm Sunday, and so is he, but it's okay. He went to Mark and Luke, and today I'm going to go to John and Matthew. We didn't trade notes, but I guess the Holy Spirit's helping us, so there's, there's no crossovers there. But thank you for that sermon, Brother Chad. What a provocation. What a consideration. It's often called the triumphal entry. Here comes the king! And you know what he was doing? He was saying, this is my death march. This is my exit. I know what they're going to do to me. You think I'm here to throw the Romans off and fix your money problems and your health problems. But not yet. He was come to fix our spiritual problems, if we'll let him. In Matthew chapter 21, look at verse number 5. Tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold, the king cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and a colt of the foal of an ass. And the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and brought the ass and the colt, and put them on their, and put on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. First thing that happened, you know what these guys did? They took off their own garments, and they put them upon this dirty work animal, so that the king could sit on that. In this culture, your coat, your garment, your clothing was about the most important thing you had. I mean, we go through clothes like it doesn't even matter. I've got some daughters that probably change four or five times a day, right? It wasn't like that back then. You can't do that. Back then, you had a very 
functional, utilitarian garment that was very purposeful in the material it was made of, how it was cut and laid out, how you used it, how you could use it for other things. It was a multi-purpose thing. And I mean, their whole life revolved around that garment. It kept them cold. It, I mean, it protected them from the sun. It had all these great purposes. But they saw, they recognized the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. They took off their own garments and they laid it on a beast for the king. Look what else it says. Verse 8. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Now, wait a minute. Now they're putting, the next group of people are putting their clothing on the ground for the animal to walk across because here comes the king. You've heard of the illustration of a, of a young man courting his bride-to-be and he would take his jacket off and put it in the puddle so that she doesn't have to get her feet dirty. That's chivalry, right? <laughs> this is honoring the Lord. He shouldn't have to walk on dirt. He's God. This is the Christ. This is the Son of God. This is the Son of Man. He's the Son of David. He's our Deliverer. He's our Savior. This is the King of Israel that we've been waiting for. He did all these miracles, these wonderful things. Everybody knew it. They were excited. They put their garments, verse 8, they spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. So they were cutting, some were waving trees, others were throwing them in the way, kind of creating that red carpet, if you will, as the Lord began to enter into the city. And the multitudes that went before, so there was a train before the Lord, and that followed, and there was one after, cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When's the last time you looked to God and you just said, Hosanna, save us. Thank you. Praise you. When's the last time you cried out of your heart unto the Lord? I mean, I'm not even talking about opening your mouth now. When is the last time you cried out of your heart with all you've got? And you're like, God, I need you. You can save me. You are so good to me. These people were excited. Verse number 10, it says, And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus the prophet of, the Nazar of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple. Now, wait a minute. He cast them out. If we read the parallel of this three years earlier in John chapter 2, Jesus made a whip and he whipped them out. Now, Jesus was not sinning, but I want you to understand how angry he was seeing a church or a congregation, a temple, buying and selling and doing business inside of the church. He was furious. He was not happy with it. He started his ministry, John chapter 1, he was declared to be the Son of God. John the Baptist baptized him. Then the Father baptized him with the Holy Ghost. He gathers some disciples to begin his ministry. John chapter 2, he goes to a wedding in Cana of Galilee, leaves the wedding, and he goes to the temple and he drives them out for making his father's house a house of merchandise. That was the beginning of his ministry. Exactly three years earlier. And now we see the end of his ministry. And he's doing the identical, the same thing. Let me ask you something. If, if I told you I had one week to live and there were some very important things that you need to remember, don't let these things slip. And I said, one of them is don't sell anything in the church. Yeah, but what if there's some booklets? We'll buy the booklets and give them away. You need a hymnal? I have 100 hymnals in the closet over here, if you want some hymnals to take home and sing with your family, I'm serious about that. Take some with you today. Don't go home without them. We don't charge for anything in this church, and we do it out of the fear of the Lord. We do it out of reverence for His Word. We do it by faith, not concerned. We're going to do the field trip to the farm. It costs money per person. I don't care. I trust that the Lord will provide. We're going to go look at the animals. We're all going to learn something. We're going to praise the Lord for his creation. And I'm not going to charge you a nickel. 
I, I feel very passionately about that. I've noticed that Jesus started his ministry and then ended his ministry on that note. It must be very important. Verse 12, it says, And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but ye have made it a den of thieves. I despise the amount of false Christian religions that are out there in the world today. That in the name of Christ, they're preaching a false gospel. They're after money. They're a bunch of hypocrites. And when you talk to somebody, you knock on their door about Jesus, they're like, yeah, I've tried religion, man. I'm not interested. And all I can say is, hey, I understand. I've been hurt too. But let me tell you about the Savior. Let me tell you about the Lord Jesus Christ because he will never let you down. He will never leave you nor forsake you. In verse 14, it reads, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. Do you understand what happened? He kicked out the merchants. He kicked out the ones that were trying to make money off the people coming in. And now the blind people and the lame people that couldn't walk, now they could get to Jesus because the commerce was gone, and he began healing them as he's ending his ministry. Verse 15, and when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, listen to this, and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Jesus started his ministry by going to a marriage in Cana of Galilee. First official act. One of the last official things he does is the children are praising him in the church and the religious crowd gets mad. We put our sermons on the internet and more than one time somebody will comment, I really enjoyed the preaching, but you know, I could hear kids, babies crying in the service. Can't you just send them away? The reason that we have a family integrated Sunday school is because I believe it's the church's job to support family growth not to tear it apart. And frankly, there have been enough instances of false religions taking your kids in a back room and teaching them something you disagree with and you find out later. Or they take them back there and get them hopped up on candy and they play borderline rock and roll and then when they're 18, they come and sit down and they're like, oh, this is church, this is boring. I want to go back with the kids. God forbid. You know what Jesus enjoyed? The children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. But the Pharisees were sore displeased. What, now you're going to let kids in the church and you're going to let them sing? Are you kidding me? Unfortunately, worship music in a lot of churches has really become this show, this artificial show of personal talent I thank God for the children that are willing to worship the Lord here. It's funny, uh, Wednesday night we had the missionary from Ukraine and uh, Brother Frank, a, a friend that comes every now and then from North Carolina, and we're all fellowship and eating in the kitchen, and it, was, it had gotten late, and we looked in the camera, and all the kids were around the piano, and I've noticed our kids, if you don't watch them, they'll just start worshiping the Lord. <laughs> Isn't that something we should praise the Lord about? When the children are using the church to praise the Lord, and I say, man, praise the Lord. If that means a few more crumbs in here we got to clean up, hey, that's okay. It's worth it. Jesus said, suffer the little children. That was one of the first things he said. Jesus started his ministry honoring a marriage, showing what mattered to him was two people, man and woman, coming together as one flesh, and he's ending his marriage, and he sees children coming in here worshiping the Son of God. Hosanna! You know what matters to the Lord? Family. Jesus loves the little children. And maybe you've forgotten that because now you're not one. But maybe you've forgotten that you used to be one. And maybe you've forgotten that God loves you as a little child. There are those that oppose themselves. The Bible uses that phrase. Sometimes some kids, they're just like, if you could see what I could see, you can't tie your shoes and you run into the wall and you can't get your stuff together. Oh, I love you. I feel so 
pitiful for you. And God looks down and he's like, yeah, that's you, buddy. That's how I feel about you. He loves the little children and so should we. And we need to train them up in that same love right here in church. Verse number 16. And said unto him, Hearest thou what these say? So the Pharisees are rebuking Jesus. Don't you hear these children? Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus saith unto them, Yea, have ye never read? There he goes back to the scriptures. Have ye never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? It's by the little children that praise the Lord that God says, Now that's perfect. Do you know why? We have the freedom to help guide their heart. Uh, my little daughter, Hosanna, she's three. When she was two, we were leaving church one night, driving home. And it was a long day, and it was quiet. And then all of a sudden, out of the very back of the van, we heard her singing her own rendition of, I want to be a soul winner for Jesus. A soul winner for Jesus, a soul. If you've ever heard a two-year-old, three-year-old, Sing about winning souls. She doesn't understand all that yet. But out of the mouth of babes, thou hast perfected praise. You know what she's not doing? She's not singing to some purple queer dinosaur or something, right? <laughs> or some, you know, robot of some sort. She's praising the Lord. And that's what we ought to do. Verse 16, let me read it one more time. And he said unto them, Hearest thou what these say? And Jesus said unto them, Yea, have ye never read? Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise. If you would go back to John chapter 21. John chapter, I'm sorry, John 12 rather. John chapter 12. And I want to pick up where we left off. In verse number 19, the Pharisees therefore said among themselves, Perceive ye how ye prevail nothing? Behold, the world is gone after him. And there were certain Greeks among them that came in to worship at the feast. Now this is interesting. This is the first mention of Greeks in the book of John. We had not heard of Jesus performing a miracle to the Greeks or the Greeks talking to him or anything up to this point. And uh, we've heard of the Romans and we've heard of the Jews and we've heard of the Nazareth and a, a bunch of other places we've heard. But now what has happened, if the goal was that the whole world was gone after him, now they've heard of him. He's been doing ministry and miracles and preaching salvation for three years. And word has spread. And now they're coming searching after him. Only this time it's different. He says this, this, I believe, was the crux of his ministry. That the gospel would reach the whole world, not just for the miracles, but for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. The Greeks were coming to eyewitness this, these things. Look what it says in verse 20. And there were certain Greeks among them that came up to worship at the feast. The same came therefore to Philip, which was at Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew, and again Andrew and Philip tell Jesus. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. It's almost like, bang, like the bell rang. He says, This is the moment. This is it. Because if you know John, several times they would say something, even in, in John chapter 2, hey, come and do this. My hour is not yet. My time is not yet. Jesus is constantly saying that throughout his ministry. Then he gets to this point. The world is coming after you and they want to see you. And he says, now it's time. Now it's time for them to see the sign of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ as a payment for the world's sins. They were here as an eyewitness. Verse 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. This is his goal. He says, I have to die. And just like every seed, you understand the gospel is, in, I mean, our creator put the gospel in every seed of every tree of every plant. It has to die and fall to the ground and then it 
springs up as new life. Jesus would do that, and so will we. Verse 25, He that loveth his life shall lose it. Now here's the warning. Guys, I'm going to die in about a week, and there's some things I really want you to know. There's some things that are very important to me, and when I depart, I'm not going to tell you anymore in this way, and I want you to know, I want you to nail it down and remember how important these things are. He that loveth his life shall lose it. If you work to build a big kingdom here, and you're going to get a bunch of land to transfer it to your kids, and get a bunch of money so you can live in peace all your days, and you, you can eat any meal you want, and you can own any car you want, you live for this life, guess what? When you get to heaven, and it's time for rewards, you've lost it. Everything you did, you will suffer loss as it goes through the fire, and God's like, that was pointless, that was earthly, that's not eternal, there's no reward. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. When it's time for the judgment, will you be honored with what you did here? The Lord says he's going to serve you in the millennium. But he's told us that we need to serve him now. This is what we're called to do. Lose your life. Hate your life. Love his life. Preach eternal life to others. If you'll look at verse 32 while we're in this chapter, final words from the Lord. And if, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's signifying what death he would die. And he's saying, listen, I'm going to draw everybody in the world. He had already told us in John that he was the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He is that true light, it says. The light is the gospel. It goes on, men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Well, Jesus is the light. And when he departs, he says that we are the light. Now he just got done telling us, wherever you're at, if you're my servant, I'm going to be there with you. So we have power, spiritual power today. And he says, I've drawn all men. Do you understand that God wants everyone to be saved? That's his will. The question is, will they take the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord? It's your choice. Whether you go to heaven or hell is 100% your choice. It's not how good your life is or if you turn it around or if you repent of your sins. That's not salvation. You need to change your mind and repent of not trusting in Jesus. Put your faith in him that he's made you a promise and it's called the gift of God which is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's free. It's forever. He did all the hard work. And he says, I'm going to draw all men. Finally in this chapter, look at verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him the word that I have spoken the same shall judge him in the last day. You understand that this is the standard that we judge by? Uh, the phrase law of liberty means Bible. It says in James 2.12, So speak ye, and so do, as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Jesus says, you have one that's going to judge you. It's right here. It's my word. And this is the standard. It's going to judge you in the end. Now, those that have rejected his word, they'll answer for every sin. They'll spend eternity in hell. And listen, God forbid don't do that. It's your choice. Take the gift. Take it freely. Believe on him. Jesus loves you. He loves the lost. It's interesting here, they come in waving their palms. Hosanna! Hosanna! Then he warns the Pharisees crowd, if you reject me, you're going to be judged. If we went ahead in John chapter 18, there were some officers of the Jews that went and took Jesus. Remember what happened? Malchus got his ear cut off. They saw the miracle of it being healed. Those same officers bring him to the high priest. And while they're talking to the high priest, one of them takes his palm and smacks Jesus in the face. A man that had eyewitnessed the miracles of the Lord and understood that he was bringing salvation. What are you doing with your palms? Are you rejoicing and praising the Lord for the victory he's given? Go back to Revelation 7 where we began. The resurrection. 
I'm going to see you there if you're saved. Not because I'm good, but because salvation is free and it's forever. We're all going to gather together one day in that great multitude from every nation. That's the end. This is what we look forward to. This is the great purpose of what Jesus was trying to demonstrate to them. When they stand with the king, Revelation chapter 7, look at verse number 9. After this, I beheld and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. When's the last time you cried out to God and praised Him for the victory that He's provided in salvation? Let me tell you something. If you're not saved, if you have any doubts in your heart right now, if you say, well, Pastor Fan, I, I know who Jesus is and I understand He died for my sins, but I, I'm suffering. I have these doubts. I have these wonders. Let me tell you right now, it's easy to be saved. It's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's His promise. That's His guarantee. He'll never take it away from you. He'll never leave you. No one can pluck you out of His hand once you're saved. It's done. You're a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus, the Bible tells us. And if you are saved, and some of the verses we've talked about tonight, today have compelled you or pricked your heart, perhaps. What are you doing with your time here? What are you doing with your hands and your eyes and your mind and your feet? What are you doing with your life? Will you come to the point where you say, I want to lose my life for Christ and I want to be a soul winner for Jesus? I want to preach the gospel everywhere I go. When's the last time you sat down alone and just read the Bible for 10 minutes or an hour? But the old sweet hour of prayer has disappeared. It's become just a, a, a glimpse here and then, oh, thanks for the food, let's go. We see this big change in Jesus' ministry when the Greeks come and the whole world has gone after Him. You know what the Greeks saw? They saw the zeal and excitement of Jesus' disciples. Does the world see that in you? If not, ask the Lord to give you a revival. And He will. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I love You so much. And Lord, I do pray that You would help us to meditate this week on the great things that You've done for us. Lord, help us to worship You and honor You and glorify You in all that we do. Lord, we need your help. It's not easy to live the Christian life, but you've given us a helper. God, I pray that you would use these verses this morning and that you would get all the glory, help them to go in our heart and help us to leave here changed. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.